Cool. Well, we're starting a series today. We're going to read through the book of Joshua. I've, ne- I've been um, pastoring for nine years. I've never, ever done this before. So um, you're privileged. Or I'm just crazy. One of the two. Um, Rich very kindly has put on Kingdom Builders every day a, a verse from, from Joshua. So we can read it through as a community. If you, don't, if you are not on Kingdom Builders, see Jordan and he'll sort you out get you on there um, and it's just so we can just read it and um, so hopefully you would have read what I'm p- going to preach on or what Nathan's going to preach on before we get there it's cool no, we should read our bible shouldn't we so um, it's going to be a bit, bit bit of a education hopefully and um, also a bit of insight oh a bottle of water you know so um, you know the first part of Joshua is all about fulfilling God's story um, but if you read the Old Testament, there's this recurring theme of God, the people, and where he wants to put them. Um, so Joshua is a, is a nether story. It's about the people's relationship with God, the promises that he has for them, and the land he wants them to take. Um, so before we get to Joshua, I'm going to give you a little bit of a quick history lesson, a quick uh, understanding. So, um, so before Joshua, there's this guy called Abraham. So Abraham has this dream, he steps out of his tent and God promises him that he's going to have as many descendants as the stars. So that's 500 years before Joshua. Uh, it's only about, I don't know, 30 pages, but it is a long time. And, and then uh, his family become the Israelites and then they get taken into captivity in Egypt. We all know about that, we've all done that bit of Sunday school. Yeah, you all with me? And then this guy called Moses gets raised up and Moses leads his people, the Israelites, out of captivity and into the desert. And then there's this moment, we all know the Ten Commandments, where Moses goes up to the top of the mountain and God makes a covenant and gives them uh, on tablets of stone uh, Ten Commandments of how they are to live their lives. And then they go on and they wander a little bit more in the desert. And then eventually they send out 12 spies to go and spy the promised land. But they come back and only two of them, which happens, one of them happens to be Joshua, says, hey, we can do this. But the rest are like, no, it's too much. There's giants, there's this, there's that. So they wander for another 12 years and then Moses dies. And then this is where Joshua takes over. Got it? Good. We're all Bible scholars now, aren't we? Yeah. And... Um, so Joshua is, is, um, is, is the chosen leader. And the thing to remember about Joshua, uh, oh, sorry, we'll book, one more thing. So the book of Joshua is broken down into a couple of segments. So we've got verse, uh, chapters 1 to 5, which is about Joshua. Oh, what's up there, look? It's about Joshua um, being commissioned as a leader and God speaks to him and say, hey, I've, you're going to go into the promised land. You're the man to do it. Stick close to what I tell you and you're going to make it. Then he has to actually physically cross the Jordan and go in there and, and, and attack all the people that are in there. So we have a whole section on battle. So for us guys, a good bit of, uh, you know, fighting. It's always good. I like that bit. And then they win. And then Joshua has all this land that he has to divide up amongst the people, amongst the 12 tribes. And then there's the final speeches. Um, they're a little bit better than the final speeches uh, you have at a wedding because they're in the Bible. So we're going to go and walk through that over the next couple of weeks. One thing you need to know about Joshua, his name is Yahweh. And those of us that are scholars, he knows he has exactly the same name as Jesus. His name is Joshua, which means Yahweh, the one who saves. Interesting, isn't it? That the person who's going to lead the Israelites into their promised land has the same name as Jesus. You know, Moses was the person who took them out of promised land, but it's Joshua that took them into the fulfillment. It's a little bit like when we become a Christian. I chose to follow Christ. I chose to put my faith in Jesus, but it's Jesus that won the fact that I get to stand in the presence of God. That makes sense? So like Moses took them out, but they had to put their faith in in Joshua, faith in Jesus to stand in the promise of what was won for them. So Joshua 1, let's start there. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses, aid, Moses, my servant is dead. Now then you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan into the land I am about to give them to the Israelites. So it starts off the whole book of this concept that Moses has died and Joshua is rising up. So Joshua was the one that served Moses. 
So, um, uh, you know, it's really important. Um, a, lot of, a lot of pastors, and, and this is a criticism of the people, uh, like, don't serve their people. You know, I think if you're ever in a church where the pastor is trying to use the church to make a platform, man, you're in the wrong church. Because when it comes to leadership within a faith, within church, leadership is all about being a servant first. So Joshua was Moses' servant. You know, Moses got to walk with God and Joshua got to walk with Moses. You know, I think it's really important as you go on your Christian journey is to find someone in leadership that you can serve. And to trust them. Yeah, we have to have a relationship with God. But uh, let me tell you, God will put people in your world that you need to have a relationship with God through them. You know, I'm lucky I've got several people in my life around the world and in the UK that I I submit myself to their leadership and I serve their leadership. Uh, And I serve and I I trust God that God will speak through them for me and for this church. Uh, And there's certain things, like especially with my relationship with Barry, where he's done things and gone places that I've never been before. And, you know, sometimes you're here within, oh, well, we're just going to go with what God says. Well, yes, we are, but we're also going to go with what people God has put in our world that have a faith. Because ultimately, 99% of the time, that is, I don't really agree with you, so I'm just going to use the God thing as an excuse to do what I want. You know, you know, but really, God put that person, and I've had some things some people say to me, and I'm like, a couple of times I've actually said, actually, I don't really think that's right, but I, I've gone away and prayed, but 99% of the time, I'm like, yeah, I know you're right, and it actually frustrates me that you're right, and I don't have a good excuse to say that you're not right, so therefore, I have to do it. It often happens in my relationship with Helen, <laughs> but I'm not going to tell her that. <laughs> you know... Um, if you want to be successful in your, in your Christian faith, be a servant. It's a biblical truth. You know, we should be a community that, you know, is, is defined by our servanthood for one another. Uh, I was listening to um, a sermon the other day and uh, someone was saying about the early church. And what attracted people to the early church wasn't because they had a New Testament Bible because they had the NFO, because they didn't have that because they were writing it. There was something uniquely different about their community that people were attracted to. And it was the fact that they served one another. That if there was a need, they, someone would go and sell a house and they put the money in the church kitty and it would get divided amongst whoever needed in the church. They were, they were a community that served one another. And people say, how can you do that? They said, because we're energized by a faith in Jesus Christ. My thing is on. I should have given this to you, Tim. It's on that auto wobbly thing. You know. The, the great thing about Joshua is when you read before the book of... Yeah, if I turn it slightly, it's like... The great thing about Joshua is when you read the story before the book of Joshua, he was the one that consistently served Moses. So when they went up to the, do the Ten Commandments, Joshua went with them. And when they came down, it was Joshua that said to Moses, hey, something's going on here. We've been away for a couple of days up the mountains. We met with God. He's given us the Ten Commandments. But we come down and these people are up to something. And they'd made, they'd made a golden calf and they started to worship something else. It was Joshua that said to the leader, to Moses, hey, hey boss, something going on. He didn't say, oh, hang on, Moses, let's see how he deals with this one. He had the back covered of Moses throughout, th- throughout their journey. You know, Let's cover those that are in leadership above us. Whether they're a Christian or whether they're not a Christian, cover your bosses back. Cover those that you do life with. Let's people, people you know... I, I think when we leave church environment, sometimes we can go back to worldly ways because it's easy to be a Christian in here. But when we go to our workplace, have your bosses back covered. If your boss is doing something wrong, see if you can build a relationship and make some suggestions on how to improve it. Or maybe you should just tip your boss off and say, hey, mate, or hey, whatever. You know, let's be those people. You know, it was Joshua that when they met in the tent and and the holies, the holies, it was Joshua when everybody left, stayed behind and spent more time praying. Those are the people that God wants to use. If you think that you have a call on your life to leadership, or you think God's got big plans, we've got big plans for every one of us, you don't get the fullness of what God has for you just because God said it. God says, a pro, you know, get a prophecy, God says something over your life, and then he looks for you to do the hard work to create your character to be that person. I prayed before I was a pastor, but I've never prayed as much since I've been a pastor. 
You know, I read my Bible, but now I have to read my Bible and study my Bible. Now I, I have to do things around leadership, around, you know, I went on an online webinar on how to be an effective communicator. It was rubbish. But anyway, and now they keep, yeah, they now keep bombarding me with stupid emails about, do you want to, you know. But I'm having to do the things to, so I can be the person. So whatever God's called you to do, serve your boss, put extra hard words and be the best person you can be. Then God will elevate you. I'm going to say my famous word, where are we? It says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give life as a ransom for many. That's Jesus. Jesus came to this earth as a servant to serve us, to serve the disciples, to serve the people around. So if Jesus can do it, we can do it. Amen? You know, I love the fact that you know, Joshua has walked with Moses. I actually think he's probably bricking himself because suddenly he spent... 40 years in the desert, he spent time with Moses, and they've talked about this promised land, and they, they went and had a look, and they came back, and there would have been, oh, you know, there would have been a culture amongst the Israelites, so they're walking, but one day we're going to get to this promised land. Don't worry, Moses is the man for the job. And then Moses drops dead. And then Joshua's like, well, who's going to take over? And Joshua has to stand into that space and study lead a nation. If God's called you to something that's way bigger than your physical capacity, praise God, because if he's called you, he'll sustain you. Just grab hold of it by faith. In, in chapter uh, verse 7, it says, Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey the law of my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right, to the left, that you may be successful in wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate it on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything that is written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. I have not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you forever. The problem is, is we get these great calls of God on, my, on your life. I've had it on my life, and then we brick ourselves. I remember uh, God gave me a vision of what, what he wanted me here to do in Wales. He woke me up in the middle of the night, and I had people singing in my bedroom that weren't actually in my bedroom in a Welsh choir. And God was like, I've chosen you, Mike, to lead a nation to sing again. It was crazy nuts. Uh, and and I, I remember waking up the next morning in an absolute panic. Why is he chosen the little boy from Seven Beach who can't read and write very well and gets scared every time he's around people that are far more successful than him? I am the wrong person for the job. I had every right to justify where I should just run out the do door and say, here you are, Nathan, have a prophecy. Here you are, you know, Jordan, here you are, you know. But God said, if I've chosen you to do it and I was willing enough to wake you up in the middle of the night and send, I don't know what, angels into your bedroom, I've chosen you, has to have the faith and follow me. You know, the bigness of what God has in front of you is so big because God doesn't want you to do it on your own. He wants you to do it in his strength. So um, God is promising Joshua that he's going to take the people into the promised land. Now, I always thought the promised lands would be like, like the size of Gwent. You know, that's, that's not a bad size. Turns out it's 3,000 square miles, right? Because I'm a geography buff. Anybody got any ideas how big the UK is? Guesses? A bit smaller than that? Go on then. Throw some numbers out. A thousand? No. No. 93 square miles. 93,000 square miles. So we're talking a place that the promised land is quite bigger than the UK. So God is saying, I'm giving you not an allotment. Tim's doing the maths. Honestly, it is bigger. I've probably written the numbers down wrong. <laughs> Bear with me. But basically, God is saying, I'm promising you a land that's not the size of Gwent. I'm promising you like a small nation. And I'm saying that you're going to take it with your people that have been wandering in the desert. You know, I think we have, a, we have a choice when it comes to what God has promised us, to have an allotment or to have a nation. I'm comfortable with an allotment. I quite like gardening. And um, I got it. I'm comfortable with an allotment. Because I can manage an allotment on my own. 
You know, I might pray once in a while that it rains or that the hedgehogs don't eat all the... What, do you know what I mean? I, 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 that's, that's within Mike Taylor's ability is an allotment. But God's promised me a nation. You know, so if, if I... And, and I have a choice to scale God down to meet my needs or to scale my faith up to meet his needs. And that's, that's the thing that scares the, the living daylights out of me is to say, God... Uh, that faith churches will be right across Wales and we will be known as a community that when we turn up in town, the homeless get feared. You know what I mean? That we really change society. I've got a dream and the dream is so big. It needs so much money. It needs so much buildings and it's just way bigger than me. But I can either have my little allotment, which is called Roger Stone, or I can have the bigness of what God's promised me. Each one of you here has been promised something so big and so much bigger than your current reality. If it is what, as a parent, as, as, a, as a mom, as a single guy or a single guy, what you see in front of you, it can be so much bigger when you grab hold of it with faith and say, God, you promised me something. If you don't know what God's called you to, it's interesting that God tells him to Joshua to stay close to him, to stay close to his word, to, to, to stay close to his command. Let me tell you, the closer I get to God, the clearer I see that my future ahead of me. Because you can't stand in the presence of God and hang on to the baggage of this world. Uh, I can't stand in the presence of God and hang on to my insecurities. Because my insecurities are are the imperfections about me and relationship with God makes me pure. So I have to choose to leave them behind and say, okay, God, I recognize these things on my personality that I am like this and I'm like that because of the stuff that's happened in my world. I recognize that, but to stand in your presence, I know you're bigger than them. I I was actually, um, Helen went out yesterday morning and I was swinging in my hammock in the garden, like you do, just um, spending some time praying and thinking about this morning, and I actually felt that I'm a different person than what I was at Christmas. You know, and I, you know about, so I've got a life coach, well, he's not, he's a mate that I ring up once a month that surfs, and we, you know, and, and, I, and I'm doing stuff, but, and I'm studying more because I want to be more like Christ. Because if I'm more like Christ, I can see the world differently, and I can possess and take hold of the things that he has for me. I, I had Peter Prothero came down last weekend, and it was really good. But I took him out for lunch, and we just had a little bit of time. And we ended up talking about something. And where before I would have shied back and just said, yes, 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 whatever you say, sir, let's just get out of the headmaster's office as quick as possible. You know, here we go again. If I don't get suspended, I'm okay. Um, do you know what I mean? That's where I went. That's, you know, a recurrent theme of my education, that was. But something inside of me says... That's the old Mike. The new Mike can actually say to Peter, brother, actually, Peter, I don't really agree with that. Uh, this is how we do it in Rogerstone, and this is why we do it, and this is, a, this is how I justify what I'm doing. And something rose up in me, and I said to Peter, and out of respect, and I was like, this is what, and I unpacked it, and Peter said, oh, yeah, that's really good. Keep doing what you're doing. And I was like, Yes. But that was a breakthrough for me. But that breakthrough only came because I've left some things behind because I've chosen to stand. And Peter said, strengthen the brand, which is Faith Church. You're onto something really good. I told him about what's happening at Hope Church. He's like, yeah. Would we have had that conversation if I'd gone back to the little schoolboy? But the reason I'm not the little schoolboy anymore because I'm trying to have his word and his commands for my life in my heart every day I walk. Faith Church, honestly, we've been promised something something crazily big. Like, if I didn't have faith, I wouldn't sleep. Because often at night, I'm like, God, I'm going to sleep. It's your it's your watch. Uh, you know, next three months, Sharon and Damon are taking a break from Hope Church. Uh, I've just become the senior pastor of Hape Church for the next three months. We're gonna, I don't really know how it's going to work. Me and Helen are like this. What is this? Look? I don't. Leadership. I, I only, do I, I, but hey, God, if you're doing it, we've got capacity to do it. We need wisdom because I don't want to run myself ragged. I don't want to run you guys ragged. But God is doing something. God is saying, well, I can add to you because there's something good here. Amen. So um, any of you want to move to Blind Avon for three months, see me afterwards. 
the chapter two is all about, so the chapter one is all about, talks about him as a servant, him, Moses has died, and God saying, come on, mate, you can do this. Stick close to my commands, stick close to my word, get a great relationship with me, and we'll bust this thing out. So, Moses, so Joshua's like, yeah, I can do it. Let's send some spies across the river to have another look. So he sends out two spies. You know, on the backstory of this is they'd done this 12 years earlier and they'd sent out 12 spies and only two had come back with a positive response. Joshua and his mate Caleb. The other 10 were like, we ain't going to do it. It's quite funny that the second time they send, they only send two people. It doesn't really say, but I reckon those two people were two people that Joshua had watched and thought, hang on, they're men of faith. It's, I'm sorry, it's men, but that's just the sexist. Like that's what they all. Nowadays, it would have been men and women. It probably wouldn't have actually been the girls, to be honest, because they would have come back and given us a more realistic um, than the men. The men probably would have got into a fight or whatever, or popped in tiny rebel whilst they were there and never came back. But <laughs> but he sends two tends two guys, you know, and, and he looks around and I've, I, I and I reckon he looked and thought, well, who's got faith here for this? I, I, I think God's looking around faith church this morning and saying, who's got faith? Not who's got skills, who's got faith? Because if I got, I got some assignments for people and I'm just looking, I've got some assignments that are going to change the destiny of faith church in Newport and Wales. I'm just looking for two people that can go into that area and come back with a positive report. Not a positive report, a true report. If they'd come back and said there's no way, they would have had to done some more prayer. But, but do you know what I mean? He's looking for two people. You know, where where I'm going to say it again. I'm allowed to say that because it's, uh, you know, they had to add faith to their fear to go and see what the promise of God was like in this place. Ooh. So he sends them out. He sends them out into uh, into the promised land. And uh, they end up meeting, let me find the right page before I say the name's wrong. They end up finding refuge with a lady called Rahab. And uh, Rahab uh, runs a venue of the night uh, with a red light in the window. And uh, they end up meeting uh, this woman. And this woman actually turns around and says, I want to believe in your God. There's something about you two guys that have turned up that makes me want to have a faith in who you are. Enjoy your coke. And and they they um they 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 work out a plan and they decide, um, she 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 decides to follow their God and they actually have a plan for when they come back and attack. She's going to put something in the window, all that kind of stuff. You can read it all in there. It's interesting that that these two spies that come out, that they choose to take their faith to overcome their fears, and they go into a place which is probably not the best place to get caught as spies and, 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 and all their culture. They end up talking to a woman, which is quite a cultural uh, uh, no-no within there. That, that you know, They're going to have to go back and say to Joshua, by the way, it's a woman that sorted us out. You know? And they'd be like, well, you split a woman? Um, that was kind of what the society was. Is, but th- they they meet this woman called Rahab, and they lead her to faith. Rahab, if you look in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, goes on to have a son called Boaz, who goes on to marry a woman called Ruth, who ends up being in the bloodline of Jesus. Nuts, isn't it? Two guys, well, and, and a nation. A guy called Joshua decides to grab hold of what God has promised him by faith, sends out two spies that's already failed once, and sends them out again and says, no, God's promised us. They go and cross a cultural barrier and end up staying with a prostitute who meets, G- who meets God, who meets, who meets faith through meeting them, who then goes on to have an eternal ripple that ends up setting a platform for Jesus to have a genealogy to be born into this world. Does that make sense? What step of faith are you being called to that will have ripples across eternity? 
Because we tend to look at, I look at my family and I, I look at my kids and I think, what do I do? And I want to make sure I've left them a good inheritance and all that kind of stuff. I want to bring them up great Christians. I, I love them to, Amber to marry a great guy. Um, he's, you know, I'm still looking for him. Applications welcome, Toby. Um, I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> I am looking forward, though, to the day she brings a boyfriend home. There's a lot of payback that's going to happen. But anyway, um, you know, I, 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 I can look at my faith journey within the aspects of this church and of this family and of what we're doing here. But I want to be part of a faith step that has a ripple that goes on into, into eternity. I, I want to pray that I meet the person that happens to, to I don't know, have a son who happens to have a child who happens to be the next Billy Graham. I don't know. But that's never going to happen if I don't take the step of faith and send that ripple out into eternity. You know, I, I, I think we, we have to be bold people of faith like these spies and like Joshua and understand that this has far more impact than just my world. You know, the way you act at work or the businessman or woman you become may change, will change society. You look at a lot of the major breakthroughs within medicine, within uh, like healthcare, you often find there's a Christian at the center of it that has boldly chosen to take their faith and follow Christ and do things that are way bigger than what their current world is. And they have ripples across eternity. Hebrews 10.23 says, Let us hold unservingly to the hope that we possess, for, for he who promises is faithful. You know, Jesus has promised us a future and a destiny He's called us to be people of change, not only for our current world, but for our, our generation, for our society, to send ripples of faith out across the decades. That's what God's called us to be. You know, it takes a servant, a leader like Joshua, to stand up and say, we're going to do this, and it takes spies to follow that servant, to follow that leader. You know, my challenge to us this morning is what faith steps are in front of you that you need to take. And you normally know they're a faith step because of the thing you've been avoiding for years. The thing, you know, one day I'm going to go back to university and I'm going to study a degree in theology. I can't wait for the day. I dread it. One day I'm going to write a book. It's going to be a pretty funny book. All of those things I dread. All of those things are things that I have over here that I know that God called me to do them. And I dread them with fear. One day, you know, we're going to have multiple churches across Wales. They're over here in the fear package. They're over in the, I'm not going there because that's too much like hard work, and I'm quite happy with my little allotment here with my little simply people, and we do church, and got people doing stuff, and it's really cool. But God says, no, that's the stuff that will have ripples across eternity. That's the stuff I'm called you to do. Because when people say, when my old English teacher one day picks up a book, and it's a photo of me looking very handsome on the back of it, and it says Mike Taylor, she'd be like, that can't be the Mike Taylor from Marwood. Guy couldn't even bloom and write a sentence, let alone his own name, and he's written a book. And I hope she reads it, and I hope she's challenged by it, and I hope she finds faith by it. And I hope she gives it to someone else and say, You won't remember, but we had this kid from Seven Beach in our church that flipped in my in our school, and he was hard work, he was. Something a bit different about him, but here's his book. You know, uh, Brian, you know, what Brian's, you know, the way that Brian is. You didn't know Brian made that guitar? And he made one next to it as well. You know, I, I think, you know, we're working with Yoss. We're trying to get organized so that Brian can run a workshop for them and they can do woodwork. Brian has some skills that will have ripples across eternity, Brian. 
I really do believe that. I believe that we've got a little room around there that we're going to, hopefully, we're praying. You can pray into this. That young guys and girls will come that are caught up in, in crime and stuff and places where they don't have no fathers or don't have no mothers, that they're living in hostels there, will come in and they'll build something like a bird box. And Brian will build a build box with them. He might even build a guitar with them. And it would change that young lad's life or that young girl's life. And that would be the first person in that family that no longer is on benefits, that gets a job, which doesn't go into a life of crime, which changes the whole eternity, the destination of that family. And in 10 years' time, the kids will come in and they say, if my mum or my dad hadn't built that bird box with that guy called Brian and hadn't met Jesus, we wouldn't be here today. That's the ripples of eternity that God has put in us and asked us to grasp. And it doesn't matter whether you're Zach Taylor's age or you're my age. The people that, Dan, you're going to counsel. The people that are going to come in and have a counseling session with you and say, this is different to any other counseling I've had before. Because you've ministered to my soul as well as my mind. And with Jan, you know, that's going to have ripples. You know what Amber and my Helen are doing with Stalver. Just going in and giving furniture to vulnerable people and praying for people. We know not everybody we pray with, but when there's a door, we pray. That's going to have ripples across eternity. We've already seen people from other faiths come into this building because we gave them a bed and a fridge. And they're like, wow, we need to check this out. You know, what Ollie's doing in the school, working with the kids, trying not to kill them because they're as ripples across eternity. One day a guy will say, I had this guy, Ollie, he was my support teacher or my other teacher or he was just the, the kind face. Something different about that guy. And he went to that church place. Maybe I should go and run to that church place and find out what Ollie had. You know what Kate does with her blog, just getting it out there. People, mums will read the blog and go, wow, something different about this woman. What's, what's the, what's the, I don't know if you can reply to a blog. I don't know. I'm not really into blogging. You can't, can you? You can comment. There's ripples of eternity. We've got a nation we've been promised. And it's time to rise up, people. It's time to be servants of God, servants of one another. Serve the vision that's on my life. I don't say that out of arrogance. I say, you know, I say that because I think God has used me to give us a vision. Let's serve it. And let's change this nation. Let's have ripples across eternity. Let's stand to our feet if we can.